Hi and welcome back to the nuke. I realized that I kind of look like a professor in this shirt. Uh, I didn't realize that it would look like a coat on camera, but um, it's just a button down. So uh, I hope this won't look too academic to any of you. Uh, but yes, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for joining me here today. Um, and today's topic is going to be something related to the climate and the environment, which has been a major theme in my videos so far. If you're a first time viewer, thanks for joining me. In this video, uh, I tend to do books on, I tend to do videos on books, um, but I've also been covering a range of topics, not just on literature, I guess, but also on the climate as well as general attitudes towards work and life, I guess. I guess anything that's got to do with finding clarity in life. Um, I tend to talk about those topics as well. Uh, yeah, so today's video is going to be something that I've been brewing on, brewing up on about in my head. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Um, and it's largely inspired by this book that I have here, which some of you might have seen before. And this is The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable by Amitav Ghosh. So this is a book that really catalyzed a lot of thoughts in my head, um, as well as a lot of inquiries into what it, what do we need to do or what do we have, to, how do we think moving forward when we have to start to regard climate change as a fact of life. So the, the, the fact is that climate change has been a reality for a pretty long time now, um, but it's definitely been coming much more to the forefront nowadays. And I would say even for myself, my consciousness uh, about climate change, my consciousness of climate change has only really surfaced really strongly um, in the past year or two and I would say I'm relatively new to all of this um, and I'm just so surprised I haven't really <laughs> delved deeper into this. I sometimes feel it's a bit too late but it's never too late and I just want to reaffirm that. And in this video, I kind of want to go further on what um, Amitav Ghosh talks about and that's about the role of literature or the role of humanities when it comes to climate change. Now let me give you some context as to why I wanted to make this video. Um, you know I've been very interested in climate change for the past year or so and uh, I've been wanting to apply my skills to this whole sector of things, right? I wanted to be able to find potentially uh, a career or a job that could allow me to use my skills to maybe say educate the public about climate change or to bring about some kind of consciousness about climate change. But, that, but as I was scrolling through all these jobs, like climate related jobs, a lot of them were very much technical skills like a lot of climate research, a lot of like policy level stuff, um, definitely things that were a bit out of my skill set. <laughs> so I found it pretty difficult um, to find any sort of climate related occupation that wasn't, you know, occurring in a lab or wasn't occurring in the higher echelons of bureaucracy. And that was kind of demoralizing to some degree. Um, but, you know, that kind of ran in contrast to a lot of things that I was reading uh, in my own personal inquiry into things, right? Um, I started to realize that there was a gap in the way that we regarded climate change over and over again in podcasts or in books or in media. People have been saying, scientists have been saying that the science has always been there. Science has always been proving that climate change is occurring at a certain rate. It is going to bring about massive changes that we are not really prepared for, etc, etc, etc. You know, even with the IPCC report that was released really recently, there hasn't really been a lot of this digestion and implementation of, of things on an everyday scale. And this is where I think humanities um, really come into the picture and specifically the role of literature because literature 
basically it's about stories it's about the way that we digest information and we remember them and subsequently how we recall them and how we reenact them in our day-to-day -day living i wanted to really explain i guess my context as well like my background i've always studied literature since young uh i don't think i uh, i don't regard myself as like a literature geek or anything like that on the contrary i was actually a really huge geek for science like um i was a huge lover of science uh, i subscribed to whatever science magazines i could get on get my hands on as a kid i was also watching nature documentaries uh, and i hated reading fiction i as a kid i could not stand books like edit blyton and i just didn't understand how people could read you know those really long series of uh, books you know i was always reading uh, lots and lots of discovery channel stuff etc I don't know when the switch happened, but I think as I went on to my preteen and teen years, I started to get really into literature. And the main reason for that was because literature gave me the space to really regard myself as a whole entity and it really helped me kind of interrogate um, my beliefs and interrogate the world around me. And to me, I think of them as pretty similar. The scientific inquiry and the literary inquiry are not much different. Um, they all are asking the same questions of how does this world function? What is our place in this world? How do we go forward as humankind? I kind of feel like all these ways of questions, like all these ways of inquiry, are fundamentally asking the same questions. And that's why I think as a kid, I was always seen as the in-between kid between like science and the arts. And eventually, I kind of settled into the social sciences kind of category, um, having majored in anthropology, which I also think is a pretty scientific, rigorous discipline in itself um, but that's always up for debate you know scientists may not really think so etc and so i want to talk also a lot about the function of literature as i mentioned before I, i've studied anthropology and in anthropology we study a lot about culture we study a lot about the narratives that is constructed within a culture. So maybe some of the things that people go through when it comes of age, what are, kind, what are the kinds of values and beliefs that are sort of conveyed through these cultural practices? Um, what does your gender identity constitute consists of and things like that um, and when I was studying all these things it was so amazing that all of this was conveyed through stories it was conveyed through a sense of community and no one is going to tell you like um, exactly that you know the way to function as a human is a set of instructions A, B, C these are all interpreted and these are all sort of um, conveyed through a set of stories, a set of um, narratives that are passed down from person to person and everywhere basically the role of the story you really really cannot discount it is how we process the world it's also how we go forward making decisions and one book that i want to talk about is this book called iwigara i don't know if i pronounced that right but it is a kind of, kind of encyclopedia of um indigenous plants um, or like plants that are of significance to the indigenous tribes in I think Native America um, and it's it, it's an encyclopedia so like you would see the entries um, really just like a kind of reference book the most amazing part of that book is that for each entry of each plant there is a corresponding origin story or there's a corresponding sort of cultural myth around that plant and that and those stories serve a particular function. Those stories are meant to tell the people, is this plant helpful, you know, and tell the people how to respect the plant. And it also tells people how to care for the plant so that its benefits and its sort of um, toxins or, I mean, its benefits and also its risks are passed down safely through generations and generations through the kind of effect of stories um, you would remember these stories uh, and then from there you know how to use the plant or you know how to regard your environment so with all that in mind i sort of see that it's true 
I have this huge gap in my life right now where I am lacking the vocabulary or I'm lacking the sort of imagination when it comes to um, climate the climate crisis in our world, the facts and the stats are all there in front of our eyes. It's there right in front of us. Like You search it up, it's everywhere. Um, week by week, even day by day, there are crises that are unfolding that have you know been indirectly also exacerbated or sort of even caused by climate change. It was all around us, um, but I do think that we are lacking the literary tools to be able to regard this as a new reality and to sort of figure out new solutions moving forward. And this is what The Great Derangements of tries to answer, um, and that's why I think it's such an amazing book that, that is really remarkable because it's been, it was published in 2016, so that's a huge, that's a whole five years ago, and yet its messages are still really relevant today. Uh, especially more relevant today where I think the humanities and the role of artists and writers and creatives can really step up and join the conversation. So I kind of want to also, uh, before I begin my major points from this book, to start off with this quote um, from a professor at Yohan U.S. College uh, and he said this in an interview in response to a question about um, climate change and fiction. He says that at this point, any fiction that hopes to be realistic has to engage climate change or else it's fantasy or historical fiction. And this is said by Matthew schneider Mearson, a professor of environmental, environmental studies at Yale University College. And I felt that this quote really encapsulates uh, <laughs> the main idea of The Great Derangement by Amitav Ghosh, which I would highly recommend for anyone to read. And that kind of leads very nicely into the first point that I wanted to raise, how literature can help to bridge the gap between our understanding of the environment and the way that we can move forward. And that is about altering reality. The fact is that most of cli climate fiction, cli-fi, is still regarded as science fiction to some degree. It's considered to be supernatural, it's considered to be speculative fiction. Um, and if you've read any of the cli-fi books, you would know that these books are generally considered to be unnatural or beyond reality, which is really strange because the fact is that um, really impossible sort of climate uh, events are happening right now, and it's not actually improbable. It's actually pretty possible that whatever is written in these cli-fi books can happen. One great example of this is The Ministry of the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson, which is a book that I read late last year, and it's a really good example of how um, there's this very vague line between what is a speculative fiction and what is really considered realistic fiction. Um, and I think Amitav Ghosh makes the argument that actually climate fiction is realistic fiction and any other fiction that tries to be otherwise that does not address climate change at all in their novels, in their narrative arc, is completely fantasy. Uh, and I think this is a pretty important point to think of um, because nowadays when we read contemporary fictions and literature there are just so many books and authors that do not address anything about the environment or anything about climate change um, and people might see climate change as a political issue uh, or they might think that it's not I'm not an activist I don't have to think about the environment but the fact is that the environment as a setting is that reality right now that climate crisis does affect all areas of life and to not address the change in the environment is to not address the reality of today um, and I think that's a pretty important point that the literary scene is making today and I think that would translate pretty strongly into how we see the everyday in that if we start to see the everyday if we start to see the modern experience as having uh, the climate change as a central tenet of how we make our decisions or how we regard other people or regard politics, um, that would be a massive change, a massive, massive shift in our understanding of ourselves, I think. Moving on to the second point that I think is really crucial in understanding climate change that literature can play a major role in is 
understanding non-human agency. Now, we might know the stats, we might know the facts, we might know everything that's got to do with the changing environment. But if we have no capacity to imagine what agency looks like beyond humans, then it might not be of any use uh, if we are unable to see ourselves as truly part of an ecosystem that regards many, many other non-human actors and many, many complex interwebs of you know, interdependence and coexistence. Um, and this is a common theme in a lot of environmental writing today, the idea of mutualism, cooperation, the idea of ecological thinking, um, the questioning of how humans have been existing as individuals um, as compared to more of a collective approach to life, a collective approach to, to sort of building communities and building structures. Um, this is a major thing that we see in science research as well. We see a lot of shifts towards this kind of ecosystem-centric studies of things, but we have not seen that being translated into our understandings of ourselves and even in contemporary fiction. The modern novel still very much regards human actors as the prime, uh, as the primary kind of tension of the book uh, or any sort of narrative. So you might have characters that are in conflict with one another, you might have, you know, um, maybe a kind of personal desire to have a moral uh, moral narrative arc and things like that. So it's very much human to human. A lot of our fiction deals with that very, very, very human uh, understanding of the world. Um, and, you know, literature hasn't always been this way. If you've ever studied classics or if you've ever studied sort of like, you know, literature that's much more ancient or <laughs> even beyond and uh, before the 19th century or 19th or 20th century, you would also realize that the environment or non-human actors like animals per se had played a very huge role in myths and in uh, cultural stories, cultural understandings, right? And the fact is that we might think of this as primitive or we might think of them as uncivilized. When we think of ghost stories or we think of all these mythologies, we see them as being somewhat primitive. But the fact is that in these mythologies of folklore, in these mythologies and in these folklores, there is sort of equal tensions between human and non-human actors. And this then translated into the way of life in people's you know, everyday living, in which the environment was this unpredictable force which you had to engage in a reciprocal relationship with. Like there, were, there had to be negotiations between humans and non-humans, and that was oftentimes a central conflict in a lot of these stories, uh, in which maybe there is an animal that had that possesses a kind of spirituality that a human has to also respect, and because of this, people were able to sort of live much more um, in tandem with the environment and the animals around them instead of trying to assert dominance over and over again. So. I would say that the mythologies then served this kind of function. It did actually allow, it actually allowed people to regard themselves as one part of a major system in which they had to play an active role in maintaining or an active role in making sure that nothing was really out of balance. Um, and you know, I, I feel like that was the reality back then and now we are shifting back into this reality where sort of like the dominance of humankind over the planet is no longer something that we can safely assume anymore. Um, in fact, we are going to be much more subject to environments, and much more subject to non-human um, agencies that we cannot predict and we cannot dominate uh, anymore. And this is the reality of it. No matter how much you might believe that technology can save humans through a further separation from environment, that is actually a lot more unlikely. It is more likely that we will probably have to really confront um, a lot of non-human non-human interactions that we are not prepared for. And I think literature can really help to prepare us for that, uh, especially when 
it comes to understanding ourselves um, in the bigger picture of things. And it helps us understand what it means to engage in much more mutual exchanges uh, rather than to only um, centralize the human in everything that we talk about, everything that we think about, and everything that we discuss. Rather, we start to be able to see and recognize in our environments um, how we are actually much more interdependent on other things around us. Now, moving on, I guess, finally, to the last point that I wanted to talk about, and this is something that Amitav Gosh also kind of raises towards the end, um, and that is the role of spirituality. Um, I think there was a point that Gosh raised that was that at the rate that we're going, if we're only arguing from the perspective of science and politics, it is very hard to mobilize a large group of people. It is absolutely difficult um, to find common consensus if we are only arguing from a, a place of rationality and a place of politics. Whereas when you talk about the realm of spirituality or you talk about the realm of much more, I guess, abstract reasonings or abstract values and beliefs uh, and then you start to have really profound uh, emotional and I guess even personal resonance with the movement. Uh, yet again, this is not something that science can just tell you. A scientist can't give you um, the data and the stats and try to convince you. As everyone knows, um, beliefs are not necessarily always centered on yeah like scientific fact or evidence even scientists themselves are also driven by their own beliefs and their values so i also think it's false to believe that you know evidence is the end all and that you know as a society as humankind we have really depended on our imaginative capacities to be able to progress forward we have always relied on our ability to to feel much more beyond our material um, selves um, and also our sort of physical environments, the fact that we have this, this capacity to reach that kind of transcendental state, um, I think is really pivotal <laughs> if we are talking about having to mobilize more people uh, in thinking about the climate crisis and in preparing for the climate crisis. And I think that's definitely another role that the humanities can play. Um, in which the humanities is the study of humankind, is the study of understanding, right? How cultures and traditions have moved people, have influenced people. And this is something then we can learn from to deploy the same kind of tactics moving forward. How can we best persuade people from the heart um, rather than through the head? <laughs> and yeah, I definitely do think uh, this is not a question that you know, uh, only one group of people can answer. I do think it requires everyone to be involved and especially artists um, and writers to be involved as well. And so for me, I will be putting down a, a few book titles below uh, of literary fictions, of I guess equal fictions, climate fictions, that have really helped me think about the possibilities of the future and helped me kind of ground my understandings, I guess, in a very factual way, um, ground those factual understandings in a very, very, very personal and existential sort of way. Um, and one really thing, one major thing that has been super helpful is also the aesthetic of solar punk or sort of the ideology of solar punk in which, you know, there is an active community that tries to really think about how a how a sustainable future looks like, not just, you know, architecturally, um, but also on a community level and also on a spiritual and kind of like um, much more on an ideological level, which is something that I think is really, really, really important um, to be able to imagine in that capacity, uh, to be able to, to think and exercise this creativity, uh, to really imagine how different the world can be in a short amount of time. Uh, this is something that, you know, I wouldn't expect scientists to do because this is not their job. <laughs> scientists are there to provide 
an inquiry into our physical and material worlds. Instead, it's up to us or it's up to people who have a deeper desire to understand people and the environment or to understand self-culture. Um, it is up to people like these to really digest that information and to relay it to the public at large. And I guess that's what I'm trying to do in this way, but I guess I'm not being very creative with it because this is just a video essay talking about my thoughts. Um, but I do hope that all of these points have clarified a little bit more about what I think, you know, um, is the role of literature and the humanities uh, when it comes to climate to the climate crisis and I think that this is a really really pressing thing um, and I hope to be able to pursue that further in this channel as well so definitely I will continue to be reading uh, all these sort of climate related fictions uh, to recommend them on this channel and to start to kind of encourage all of you to think about uh, think about that to think about the potential changes in your perception of reality, um, the sorts of ways that we tell stories uh, to ourselves, but to also to other people, to future generations. What are the kinds of stories will we tell them? Will we have stories that talk more about how we have more of a mutual relationship with the environment? Or will we have to tell stories that are all about extractive capitalism? Do we only, will we only leave a legacy of stories about labor alienation about you know capitalistic bosses with no regard for human ethics and no regard for environmental protection are we going to leave stories like that or are we able to create stories that talk about you know a great spiritual awakening uh, that has really benefited life in all forms human life um, animals plants Will we see a resurgence of biodiversity in a way that we have seen, you know, in a way that we have never seen before? Are we able to see ourselves not as saviors, but are we able to see ourselves as one small puzzle piece of the bigger picture, one small blip in the whole scheme of time? And, you know, this is quite an interesting route to go down to because I, I really do think that literature can sometimes feel very egoistical. I do think that literature can feel very self-indulgent. It is all about digging deep into what it means to be human. But I think that is its greatest asset as well. I think that what it means to be truly human is also to consider what it means to be living right now in this really changed world where we are now subject to these forces that we've always been subjected to. But the fact is that now we have to confront the implications of our own actions um, and we have to really dig deep within our histories you know deep deep into our past traditions and cultures and to learn these lessons from our ancestors and also to learn these lessons from the indigenous tribes who have been so resilient and have been able to portray such a huge love and respect for one another and the land and the animals and all that so you know, I, I think it is a pretty crucial turning point right now. It is really scary. I struggle with, you know, climate anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but this is how I'm trying to manage it. I am trying to find all sorts of ways of inquiry that can help to ease this anxiety and help to figure a way forward. I kind of feel like a, like a little mole, you know, like digging down all sorts of routes and you know, being stuck in this position of being someone that's um, much more interested in social science, trying to find a much more direct application of my interests <laughs> and also my understanding of things. So yes, that's it for this video. Um, yeah, I hope that made sense. I, I really don't know. I was just going straight for it. Um, and, you know, this has been a super important topic. Um, and I hope that this might have been important to you as well. Uh, oftentimes, if we search about climate change or climate crisis, uh, it's easy to see a lot of information out there. Um, but I feel like we need to have a lot more nuanced discussions about how we start to 
come like we you know really radically alter our sense of self and our sense of agency and environment uh, in order to really move forward because there are a lot of changes that are going to happen and we have to be sort of psychologically but also culturally prepared for those changes uh, and i think that that is at least one area that <laughs> i'm a little bit more confident in uh, the cultural arena uh, i definitely cannot tell you um, anything that's got to do with ppm or anything that's got to do with the latest carbon capture technology um, maybe i'll try but i, I probably shouldn't <laughs> So thanks again for watching this video. Uh, do let me know your thoughts about whatever I said in this video. Uh, feel free to share whatever you've learned in your own way as well. I would love to read also whatever you have read. And I know that a lot of people have commented other books uh, that I will try to compile and leave it in this video description as well. Yes, um, this is scary but also... A great opportunity I want to think that we try to be positive I guess um, and I'm pretty excited I think to, to delve deeper into creative climate fiction um, and this has sort of been a paradigm shift in my life as, life as well so yeah I hope this encourages you at least to seek out um, some more climate fiction uh, to question your own understanding of literary traditions as well so thanks again and uh i'll see you in the next video uh, i hope it will be a nice chill one i actually adopted a kitten over the past week and i've been completely busy <laughs> with this little kitten uh, maybe one day she'll appear on camera who knows uh, so yes i hope you are doing fine um, if not, I do hope you take the time to rest, recuperate, um, really take care of yourself and your loved ones, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much for joining me, and see you! Bye!